Welcome to the Holistic Health Podcast, beautiful humans. If a professional, polished, well-edited podcast is what you're after, then move right on. If, however, you love unfiltered banter, unedited bloopers, authentic heart sharing, and a very generous dash of holistic health education, then you're in the right place. Let's dive in, shall we? Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Holistic Health Podcast. We have a special impromptu somewhat emergency episode that we are bringing you today um, because at the time of recording this episode we are about oh not that not that many days you know away from the end of the most severe floods um, or floods that have been happening in northern rivers of New South Wales so last week when I recorded an episode by myself I mentioned to you guys that Amy wasn't able to be with me because she had no power due to the floods. So, Amy, hi, hello, how are you? And can you give us an update of what the heck happened for you? Oh, my gosh, I'm so grateful to be alive and so thankful to be in the position that I'm in. Um, At this time, I still don't even really have the words to eloquently share just quite what's going on at the moment and quite what this regional area has just experienced. Um, All I can say really is for my own experience, which was certainly one of the lucky stories, um, that it was a real lesson in how things can go from normal to potentially very, very dangerous in just a matter of hours. So where I am in Kingscliff, um, we lost power. We were without power for a week. We were without internet for two weeks. This is literally the first day um, that we've had internet. And even then it's like really sketchy (laughs) Um, and barely any phone reception whatsoever. And for me, what happened is we got cut off by water and whilst where I am, I'm up on a bit of a hill so we didn't actually get flooded. Uh, We were cut off from everywhere else and three of the supermarkets, there's three supermarkets in that initial area that I'm in and two of them went underwater, which meant there was only one left to service the population here. And whilst I'm very proud to say, no, I didn't see anyone panic buying things uh fresh fruit and vegetables and meat disappeared very quickly just in a matter of hours and Mm. so did the water and one of the tricky things about that was there was sewage contamination in the supply water supply which meant you had to boil it for it to be safe to drink except you didn't have power to boil it to make it safe mm -hmm. to drink Um, so that was you know, that was just one aspect of that. Not having power meant you couldn't keep what food you had fresh. So all of that went in the bin. Not having power meant you couldn't cook what food you had either. And for me, you know, we had a little bit of water and a little bit of like dried food. And it was just, it was just a real lesson in how underprepared I think most of us are in the event of a natural disaster. Um, Mm. And I'm definitely not an expert in that, but I am schooling myself very quickly on what to do in the event something like that happens again. And, And, you know, for one, just to give one example, I was really surprised to learn that per adult, you want to allow for four and a half litres of water a day. So we kind of think, oh, you need to drink two litres of water a day. And that's obviously a little flexible depending on your size and your own physiological needs. But when you then think about brushing your teeth, cooking, water you might need for cooking and food preparation, water you might need for cleaning up afterwards, cleaning yourself, um, hand washing things, um, you actually need a lot more than you think. And I would also say just a special little mention to uh, those of us that are fur parents. It was also um, something that we were a little unprepared. You know, our 
pets eat quite a raw food, whole food diet. Our dog only, she's French, she's part poodle, <laughs> which means <laughs> she is extremely fussy with what she's very cute. <laughs> oh, she's adorable. But it was really scary. Like when the water was sold out, you know, I was buying fruit juice um, for the humans because we needed to save the water for the pets because they obviously can't drink fruit juice and um, trying to get meat for Lily. That's my little spoodle who, by the way, just turned one today. It's her birthday today. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Happy birthday, Lily. Happy birthday, guys. Lily. Um, so it's, fortunately some of the restaurants still had some food and, you know, we, would, we were ordering like food from the restaurants for her because we didn't have anything that she would eat otherwise. And so... It was just such a massive wake-up call uh, where you think, you know, you can easily access what you need at any time of day, night, week, month, or year, and very, very quickly things can go pear-shaped and become very dangerous very fast. And like I said, I was one of the lucky ones. So I'm just really mentioning that because I feel like because we live in a country where things are generally very accessible. It's very easy just to fall into the mindset that she'll be right. I think that's an Aussie thing anyway. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, if anyone's listening, if you're listening to this today, I would invite you to look at how prepared you are for a natural disaster um, because, you know, the preparation that I thought that we had done was just grossly insufficient, grossly insufficient. Um, mm. And, like I said, we're one of the lucky ones. There are still places without internet, without power, which means they can't keep their food fresh, which means they also can't dry down building materials or have any hope of saving their personal possessions. Um, so even things like, you know, what kind of generator you might have in the event of a power failure are other things to consider. Mm. Uh, but certainly we're seeing now... Um, the collateral damage that happens when those things, you're unprepared for those things. Uh, and also, understandably, but mistakenly so, believing that local, state and federal authorities will step in um, for disaster recovery and disaster relief and search and rescues uh, for anyone who maybe wasn't following the unfolding events that closely. Uh, we have been seriously neglected, and that is putting it mildly, by uh, different bodies that are meant to be the first responders in an event, in an event like this. And you know, we're still uncovering why that is and how that came to be. But what it meant was I think it would be very reasonable for any one of us to think in the event of a disaster that rescue is imminent, that someone's on their way to help, someone knows that something is wrong and someone's taking action. And this experience highlighted um, a lot of bureaucratic bungling uh, amongst other things, which are probably outside the scope of our podcast to talk about, political shenanigans. Um, but what that really meant that, you know, the all of the rescues that were done, all of the retrievals, all of the um, initial deliveries of food and water and generators um, were done by locals. And I'm just, I, I can't even say how fortunate I feel to be living in a region of just dead set legends mm -hmm. who, you know, um, immediately stood up and got up and, and did the work. Um, and thank goodness we, we have that here because, you know, it was five days before um any officials actually decided to take action. And now two weeks later, we have got some boots on the ground. Um, again, I would suggest that the response is not a match for the magnitude of what people are dealing with, but it's become very clear um, that the best way to prepare is to consider that you're going to have to rely on yourselves and locals, friends, families, neighbours, um, things like that. So, yeah, it, it was it was a horrific experience for everybody in a multitude of different ways. 
And I think this is going to take a long time to recover from. And one of the things that's been the most traumatic for me is having been made very unwell from toxic mould, from water damage. Mm. What breaks my heart is whole towns have been submerged for, for days on end and there hasn't been the resources to dry things down in a timely manner to allow buildings to be recovered safely and, of course, the possessions that were found within them. So today I've just really, yeah, we're having this conversation so that people understand just how quickly things can become contaminated and unhealthy and therefore unrecoverable. And This is really, you know, I guess on the back of the episodes we've already done around how mold can make you sick, just really um, reiterating what constitutes an appropriate response at this time if you ever get flooded, because you may not be in the northern rivers right now, but, you know, there are lots of areas that are potentially at risk for flooding down the line. And, you know, you just never know when another natural disaster might happen and major water intrusion might occur. So, I'm looking forward to just sharing these guidelines uh, so people have a bit of a better understanding. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure that a lot of this is relevant even if someone was to have a massive leak in their home. So I think, you know, it's everyone can take something away from this conversation and it's Mm -hmm. really, it's, it's something that I think, as you said, it's, You don't really, I mean, I certainly wouldn't call myself prepared in any which way. And I think that we do, or maybe, maybe I should speak from I, but I certainly take for granted the fact that, you know, more and more I'm realizing that you can't necessarily rely on them, whoever they are, Mm -hmm. to come and rescue you at any point in time. And So I think while that can be confronting, and I certainly find it confronting, not being someone that I I wouldn't call myself particularly skilled in just (laughs) survival. (laughs) Lucky my husband is so. Um, But I, you know, I think it's, it's confronting. And I think that a helpful response is to start to learn, even if you're like me and feel a bit clumsy and it feels clunky and and it feels like it's easier to just think that it'll never happen to me Mm. it's good to just learn so I think somewhere where I'd love to start is just understanding a little bit more about what happens in the process of water damage or water intrusion so what I mean by that is you know we're aware that yes mold can grow but How long does it take for bacteria or mold to grow after water, like a building or a home or whatever it is, has had water damage? Mm. So this is a bit of a horrifying revelation, so brace yourselves, everybody. (laughs) But even if it's clean water, so category one water, and I'll talk about the three categories of water in a minute, but Let's say a pipe bursts in the kitchen and it's like the clean water pipe coming out of your tap as opposed to the pipe that's draining, you know, dirty dishwater away. Anything that is wet for a period of time is going to allow microorganisms to grow. And generally speaking, what we know is that bacteria start to proliferate after just 12 hours. So... There is a huge focus on mould, understandably, in part, I think, because mould is a visible proxy for water damage, significant water damage or water water intrusion that has persisted for more than a couple of days. Uh, But the truth is wherever there is food and water, all all manner of microorganisms are going to start to grow and bacteria actually kick in first after 12 hours. And this is why we often see chronic infections being a bit of a red flag for damp buildings uh, and leaky buildings because not only is mould growing but so too is bacteria, which of course can create bacterial infections, but also 
bacterial endotoxin, which is a metabolite of bacterial proliferation, very much like mycotoxins being produced by mold, can be very poisonous and inflammatory to the body. So it can be just 12 hours when we're starting to see bacteria grow. But when it comes to mold specifically, 48 hours onwards, like the window you have to dry things is two days max. So what that means is if someone overflows the spa because they put all of this, you know, liquid soap in it, not speaking from experience or anything. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> or someone puts normal dishwashing liquid in the dishwasher because they've run out of that stuff, not speaking from experience, then either... <laughs> Um, <laughs> or, you know, there's any number of things that can happen in a household, um, you know, especially if you've got little kids, little people or clumsy people, you know, things can get spilt very, very easily. You need to get that dry within 48 hours to avoid mold growing and ideally in less than 12 hours to inhibit bacterial growth. Now, in the case of flooding, especially in this case where the volume of water was so huge and so persistent, Homes have been underwater for days and days and days, which means, you know, even if the water was category one, so clean rainwater, which it probably was initially, um, it becomes category three. So I'll talk about the categories actually now, just so people are really clear on that. So category one is water, is a water that originates from a initially a sanitary water source. So this is usually water from um, broken water supplies, bathtubs, sink overflows, assuming there's no contaminants, appliance malfunctions, with, if that's from the water supply line, or even things like rainwater, um, you know, water tanks broken, toilet tanks broken, things like that, anything that doesn't contain contaminants. And we don't get snow here in the Northern Rivers, but certainly in parts of Australia, melting snow would also be considered category one. So the water itself is not considered to be um, a source of bacterial or microbial contamination. Um, the issue with that is once clean water actually um moves on from where it came out of something, whether that's a pipe or a bathtub or a water tank or the sky, it can then deteriorate into category two or three over time. So untreated water for 48 hours then becomes category two, meaning it contains significant contamination. So even if the sewage and the stormwater hadn't been Im impacted by the flood, two after two days of that water just kicking around, it would be considered to be contaminated. Um, that being said, category two water examples outside of that are those from uh, discharge or overflow from, say, washing machines, dishwashers, uh, toilet leaks, as long as they only contain urine, are considered category two. As soon as there's fecal matter, it's automatically category three. Um, mm. Things like a fish tank that maybe um, has exploded or leaked or broken down would be considered category two. So obviously it's not pure clean water, but it's also not, you know, super dirty either. Um, after 48 hours, so category two water, becomes category three and category three is obviously the most toxic of them all. It's considered to be highly contaminated and containing, you know, harmful agents of any nature. So that might be um, microbial, um, particularly pathogenic microbes, um, toxicants and other harmful agents. So examples of that are obviously sewage and toilet backflows, um, but anything else that might contain uh, pesticides, heavy metals, toxic chemicals. We can even consider like farm runoff to be in category three. If um, it's, you know, a conventional agricultural approach has been to use, you know, standard pesticides. Um, and all forms of flooding are considered to be category three. So whether that's seawater, so from a surging king tide um, to ground surface water, in this case, you know, the heavy rains created surface floodwaters, um, any other kind of uh, weather-related event as well, whether it's a storm, hurricane slash tornado, um, a water spout are all considered to be category three just because the contents are so um, potentially problematic. 
So mm. with this, because there was such a huge volume of water over such a short space of time, it did unfortunately create backflows through the stormwater system and through the sewage system, which meant what you would ordinarily have thought to have been like essentially clean rainwater running over land was actually just a hodgepodge of all kinds of stuff that it was collecting along the way. And I can actually say as well, you know, uh, I took Lily for a walk on the beach um, a few days ago and there was so much rubble and debris in the water Mm -hmm. and the sea foam was really really thick so you couldn't even really see the water on the shoreline obviously we've had huge erosion with the beach like dunes just stripped away but there was logs in the water and I almost got like taken out by a log come like coming in with one of the incoming waves and you couldn't see it under the sea foam and so you know um floodwaters can be incredibly dangerous for many many reasons but and, you know, the microorganisms that proliferate or can be found in there are an issue along with debris, which at the very least might cause, you know, surface wounds to the skin, um, which would allow, you know, any microorganisms in the water to get into the body, which we're seeing now, you know, we're seeing cellulitis, sepsis, uh, and some other conditions as well related to that exposure, um, some of which, you know, were incurred during the floods themselves, but a lot of them are occurring now where people are trying to clean up and are being exposed to really toxic sludge. Um, You know, all it takes is a little nick on the finger as you're cleaning, you know, this material, and then very, very quickly you can end up with, you know, a blood infection. So pretty hairy stuff. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And it's there's just so many flow on effects that you don't think about until I guess you're in that kind of situation and it's and it's happening. Mm. So I mean, I I get the categories of of water and the and the timing of that kind of thing. And and where I'd like to go to next, if there's nothing else you want to add to that, is if someone is okay, they're in this situation where mm. their home, their belongings have been water damaged. And they're in a position of trying to salvage what they can. Mm. I'm aware even just in previous episodes where we've spoken about water damage and and, and mould and all that kind of stuff that, mm. you know, it's not as far as what can be saved and what can't. It's not all created equal because I guess on a very, even at just a very surface logical level that I'm sure many people can connect the dots on something that's porous versus non-porous is obviously going to be quite different mm-hmm. but how like how does how does someone work through what can be saved and what can't be saved and how would you advise people to kind of go about that process mm. so in an ideal world you would get an appropriately qualified professional to help you. We might just talk at the end, you know, how to find a building biologist to do assessments on anything you're a bit unsure about and also how to find, you know, a double ICRC certified remediator as well to remediate anything that potentially could be saved in a manner that would be safe. And I think maybe the distinction needs to be made at this point there is a big difference between the approach that a building biologist would take and maybe a traditional building assessor. And this is actually where, you know, problems can can arise very, very easily because a typical building inspector or maybe a structural engineer um, or even, you know, a builder or some other sort of tradesperson, they might come in with a lens of, is this going to be structurally sound if we leave it? Can we dry it out so that it's structurally and cosmetically acceptable to the occupants? And that approach doesn't take into consideration or even remotely acknowledge the health effects of the kinds of microorganisms that proliferate in water damage building materials. And one of the things that has been very distressing to see here is, you know, in some cases there isn't flood insurance for some of the properties because they are in a flood zone and they've been allowed to build there and whether or not that should have been the case 
is a conversation for another day. But because they're in a flood zone, they are often more affordable. And so for those who really need affordable housing, they are left in a position where that's all that is available to them, but they can't get insurance for the property. And Mm -hmm. if they are a tenant renting a property, they often can't get contents insurance for flooding either. And, you know, there was a quote from a US politician called Bernie Sanders that I think he may made a statement about, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, maybe even slightly earlier, just saying it's very expensive to be poor. And I just keep coming back to that because, you know, in this case, people might be living in areas which are less than ideal environmentally speaking, but it's because the we had a housing crisis here before the flood. And when something like this happens and wipes out all of your belongings and you don't, you can't even get insurance, um, assuming you could afford to pay the premiums anyway to replace all of your things. So, you know, washing machines, fridges, like some necessities of life are gone, including Mm -hmm. beds and, you know, amongst other things. Um, So, yeah, very, very tricky. And, And what that's resulting in is a lot of people are trying to cut corners about what they can keep. Just to give you a bit of an example, you know, there's a number of caravan parks in this area and it's a real blend of holiday makers that come to stay, but also permanent residents, um, many of them quite vulnerable, some of them elderly um, or, you know, um, impacted in some ways either because of health or age or both. And what I'm seeing happening is personal effects are being discarded, but they're leaving the cabins to dry down on their own. They're not even using um, devices to help speed that process up. And what's going to happen is those people are often, most of them are still in there in the damp and water damaged building and they're going to then refurnish that afterwards and be living in a water damaged property and because of the relative humidity here anyway whatever microbes are in there are just going to continue to proliferate it's going to contaminate their new possessions and it's going to impact their health and i'm also seeing one of the other challenges we have is there isn't a legal standard um, beyond visible mold that investment property owners must adhere to and and, you know I think that's wrong and part of my professional mission so wrong so wrong so wrong it's honestly outrageous what um, some property owners are getting away with I saw a post in our local Facebook group this morning where the water was up to the ceiling height so all the cupboards kitchen cupboards have swollen and warped because you know we're building um, cabinetry and you know homes out of highly refined materials which take on water very easily and are a preferential food source for microorganisms because they're pre-digested and the landlord has basically said to the tenant well as soon as it's dry you just move back in and that's it I'm leaving all the warped and swollen doors and cupboards Mm -hmm. and walls and skirting boards in there and from a health perspective, I can tell you right now that is problematic for anybody and everybody, regardless of whether you have a mold susceptible gene or not. And so I guess going through the, the three sort of categories of contents and when it comes to remediation, you mentioned before the word porous, sort of three main silos things would sit in, porous, semi-porous and non-porous. And the porosity of something really points to how much water it can take on. So if we start with non-porous materials for a second, these are things like metal, glass, plastic, and often finished wood. Now, proper timber, of course, can take on moisture over time, but in the case of maybe a few days, you might be able to dry that down carefully and it might be okay. Natural wood has natural resins that are antimicrobial and, of course, being a living, you know, product, they're used to dealing with water anyway when they were alive. So most of those um, don't take on moisture either on the surface or or deep into the material, which means it isn't going to support microbial growth that much, if at all. Um, 
So those kinds of things you could easily clean the surface of and keep them. And so some practical examples of that would be, you know, thinking out loud here in the kitchen, stainless steel pans, cutlery, crockery, um, you know, Tupperware, for example, although extended moisture um, and mold growth can actually cause mold toxins to stick to the plastic, but we'll, we'll come to that in a second. If your dining table or your desk is glass and, and stainless steel, you know, a wipe down on all of those things and a thorough clean, they'll be okay. What do you wipe them down with? Because there's a lot of different ideas out there, both in the quote unquote natural world and also in the conventional bleach everything world. Can you clarify (laughs) what exactly would be for these specific materials that are non-porous, what would be the best thing to wipe them down with? Again, it depends what lens you come at it through. So for example, Uh, some perhaps more traditional cleaning agencies would suggest diluted bleach is fine. But the toxic fumes from the bleach and also the fumes that can be created when it it comes into contact with mould would not be considered to be appropriate from a health point of view. So for someone who was really sensitive, even just a damp microfiber cloth would be enough and this is this is especially if something's already wet or covered in mud if it's dry you might HEPA vacuum first to get rid of the bulk of the debris and then maybe you would damp microfiber wipe again and then vacuum again just really Mm -hmm. depends on the condition that it's in you know um, it's different if it's a home that's been leaking versus something that's been flooded so when something's been flooded it's likely to be quite sodden it's quite likely to be covered in all kinds of other debris, like certainly in the case of the Northern Rivers, there's the sticky mud that's just on everything, uh, which Mm -hmm. you might even need to water blast off um, to sort of clear it enough to be then be able to wipe it down with a damp cloth. But basically diluted vinegar, you can add clove oil for good measure if you want to, but the antimicrobial component is far less important than the physically moving the spores and the microbes off the material that you're cleaning Mm -hmm. Um, again it depends on you know what category of water it's been exposed to and all of those kinds of things but if it was me I'd probably do even warm soapy water would be enough but I'd probably do warm soapy water with a dash of vinegar and a little bit of clove and a Mm -hmm. microfiber cloth and then if you're lucky you'd put it out in the sun shine to dry like that's easier said than done. Today is the first day the sun's come out in weeks. Um, and so even once the floodwaters receded, uh, a lot of people didn't have anywhere to actually dry things. That was yeah. clean. Um, and just before you keep going, I just wanted to clarify for anyone who heard you say HEPA, fil- um, HEPA oh, vacuum, yes. a HEPA filter is something that you can, a filter that you can have for your vacuum cleaner. So just mm-hmm. check that your vacuum cleaner has one and if it doesn't then I definitely would recommend changing vacuum cleaners because it's yes handy to have that over the long term and they're not that much more expensive or can be just the same price as ones that don't have mm-hmm. a HEPA filter so I would yeah recommend making that switch yes and also if you're looking at air purifiers you want to make sure it's Uh, it has a HEPA filter as well. So HEPA is an acronym that stands for High Efficiency Particulate Absorbing Filter and basically filters down to a very, very small like nanoparticle size. So not only is it going to capture things like dust and dirt, which typical filters on a vacuum would, it will also capture spores, microbial particulate, endotoxins, mycotoxins, and things like that. So um, it's definitely the one you want to be looking for. And if your vacuum doesn't have that, I would definitely upgrade at some point. Um, Mm. But the HEPA sandwich that they talk about is using a HEPA vacuum to actually take off the the bulk of the um, particulate matter. So, yes, thank you for clarifying that. No worries. I know you're used to talking about it all the time. So every now and again, I'm like, yeah. hey. <laughs> wait, what does that mean? Because I remember um, at one point in time being like, what? I yeah, totally, it. totally. Until you know, you don't know, but that's Absolutely. that's good. Um, okay, sorry, I interrupted you. So mm-hmm. we're done. So we're, we've cleaned or categorized the things that we can categorize into mm-hmm 
the non-porous category and we know how to clean those or we have a few options, yes. what's next moving through the categories and how to potentially clean them or not? Yeah, so the next one is a category that's considered to be semi-porous. So things like stonemasonry and unfinished wood, so wood that hasn't been um, sealed or lacquered, these things are a little bit more absorbent and can take on water. And again, it depends on the category of water it's been exposed to, the period of time that it's been exposed to that water as to whether you're going to be able to recover it or not. So this is a bit of a gray area and would require assessment. Um, And when I say assessment, um, there's three conditions that that a an assessor would really categorize things into. So condition one would be considered to be normal fungal ecology. So just so everyone knows, mold is everywhere. There's no, no place on earth that is sterile and free of mold. I mean, there's mold happily growing in Chernobyl under radioactive conditions, like just literally everywhere. They're like the cockroaches of like the vegetable world like you just you'll never get rid of them they'll survive an atom bomb like it's crazy and so there is a microbiome um, and I use that in the broadest sense of the word that is considered to be normal ecologically speaking so your home will have a natural distribution of microorganisms including fungi and bacteria that aren't considered to be problematic health-wise or toxigenic or out of the ordinary but there are two other conditions that would indicate an increase in fungal growth um, and proliferation and also a shift in the species which would indicate you know, water damage, water intrusion, high humidity. So condition two is where we find spores that have settled onto the surfaces, meaning they haven't sort of embedded themselves into the surfaces, put down roots and are growing into it, but a surface sample will reveal that the air has distributed, you know, problematic fungi onto the surface um, and maybe fungal fragments. And in some cases that's going to be able to be cleaned, but in the case of like porous things, which we'll talk about in a minute, you can't get it out. And so condition two, settled spores and fungi on, you know, a, a wooden dining room table, no problem. We can clean that easily. But if you found that in say um, your pillow or your mattress, there's nothing you can do to get deep into the mattress to pull it all out, and that would be problematic. And then condition three is where we actually see fungal growth happening, so visible mould growth or detectable mould growth. And the way that fungi put down roots or hyphae um, and out in nature, obviously mycelium is another aspect to that under the ground. You can't kill that off or clean it off and therefore the item must be discarded. And so that typically is the case for porous materials. And what that looks like is in a home, a traditionally built home, when I say traditional, I mean like typical and common, not necessarily like traditional building methods, but like the plasterboard we use in our walls, yeah, highly porous. If you have had a flood and you didn't get that dry within 48 hours, you've actually got to cut it out and cut it out a metre above where the water line was because with capillary traction we can see water actually travel against the flow of gravity <laughs> and mm. contaminating that material too. Um, things, other building materials that are included in that category are things like carpet, um, MDF and chipboard, um, you know, sort of unfinished pine bed frames, things like that. Uh, nothing against Ikea, but pretty much anything from Ikea. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I have two Ikea bookshelves behind me that, you know, have laminate on them, but the inside is just, you know, highly refined wood product that's going to swell and support microbial growth, you know, very, very quickly. Um, but also other things that are considered porous are anything made of paper or fabric. So um, things like artwork, certificates, books, photographs, clothing, shoes, um, you know, cushioning, couches, mattresses, pillows, all of those things, um, if they weren't bone dry within 48 hours, they're going to have to go in the bin. Right. 
So, you know, I I know there's a family just down the road who had a lovely leather couch that went underwater and they don't want to throw it out, but it also wasn't dried within 48 hours. So it's moldy, um, even Mm. though they don't want it to be. And you can wipe the surface of the mold, you know, off, you can bleach it, but it doesn't take away from the fact that it's present and is going to cause health issues of some description over time. And yeah, as a result, you know, there are a lot of people who are trying to hang on to things that are going to be causing them health problems going forward, which is, you know, very upsetting. I can understand it. I know when we had a water leak, the one that made me really sick, um, I did a lot of the remediation myself without proper PPE because I didn't know any better at the time. And I did manage to save some things, but a lot of things that I thought that I was I had saved just eventually I realized just were making me sick or I could see the mold growth coming back every time. Mm. It just wasn't going to happen. So yeah, very difficult position to be in. Yeah. And it's hard because although sometimes you can see visible mold, there's a huge portion of time where you can't actually see Mm -hmm. the mold. And I, I think that that can be, make it so easy just to sweep it under the carpet and ignore it. And I guess our encouragement is to not do that because it'll yeah. end up costing you far more in the in the long run. And yeah. it's so hard to say, like, I, I don't know about you. I find it really hard to tell people that in consultations. I mean, I do, but if they've been in a water damaged apartment and they're finally moving and they ask me, what do I think about them taking their yeah. couch with them, especially when they love it or they're in a position where they're not financially like they Mm. can't afford to buy a brand new couch Mm. I just I feel like I have to say it and it's really hard because you know the the thing they want to hear is that it's okay just take Mm. it with you it'll be right but Mm. I know that it won't be right Mm. the question I have off the back of that is specifically around the clothes and the shoes so Mm. I know you said that Um, If it's not dry within 48 hours, then in the bin. In the instance that they've caught, you know, the clothes situation within 48 hours, how do you advise people washing their clothes? Like say it's within that 48 hours, their home or whatever it is has been Mm -hmm. water damaged and they have a chance to wash their clothes and then dry them. Is there anything specific that they should be washing their clothes and shoes in to help Um, that situation or is it just literally a matter of washing them and then getting them bone dry? Mm. To be honest, um, this is an area where I think a lot of people overcomplicate it. Um, If you have caught it early and it's more just settled spores and fungal fragments, just a standard wash is usually enough and then drying it in the sun if the fabric can um, take that and if not drying it you know with the dehumidifier and so it dries really quickly and this is assuming there's no visible mold growth um if you are really sensitive and you want to be uh you know i guess maybe take extra precautions um you could put a few drops of clove oil in along with the washing powder or the washing liquid i know some people really like using borax for that Um, There are specifically antifungal washing liquids you could buy that often use things like eucalyptus. I know there's like a pharmaceutical one um, that Caniston make um, for chronic fungal infections. Sorry, it just makes me laugh that Caniston make it. Okay. Yeah. Well, the thing is, here's the thing. Chronic skin fungal infections are often because of mold in the home and fungi growing in the clothes. And, you know... I know yeast and yeast and fungi are, you know, virtually two sides of the same coin and mm. canisters diversified into <laughs> cleaning products. Yeah, now, that gen your clothes. Oh, I mean, look, that would be my last, last choice. Um, yes. <laughs> but I would, you know, I, I've definitely used clove oil. I know people have had good results with borax. Most of the time, it's not necessary. Where you need to use those things is if you found something with mold growing on it and it's a small patch and you're hoping to recover the clothing. It's not an exact science. And I think this is where people can get really tripped up. And it's, oh, it, 
I can't even tell you there's like the perfect one answer and right way to go. All I can tell you is I have seen time and time again, people try and hang on to furniture in particular, but sometimes smaller personal items and those items, the contamination has been enough to keep them sick and continually Mm -hmm. trigger their immune system. And, you know, after a period of time, sometimes it's months, sometimes it's years, they finally get sick of feeling sick and go that extra mile and let things go and then they recover. And then, of course, understandably, they become proponents of just burn everything to the ground and start again, okay, because, they, you know, no one wants to continually be sick. Um, The other thing is especially if that illness is affecting your ability to make money, like you're trying not to spend money or lose your things, but if it's stopping you from recovering enough to work, that's a problem. Um, That being said, I've also seen you know, proponents of just literally set everything on fire and walk away naked and buy everything and start from scratch. That would be me, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And look. But you, not necessarily the right way to do it, just my personality. <laughs> well, so here's the thing. Like, obviously, you don't risk taking anything with you that can perpetuate your ill health and your symptoms. But what I can tell you is, so our couch was leather. And there was no visible fungal growth. And and even though it was quite low set, that was actually okay. And yet I had a silk, the certain materials that mold really likes, like the natural materials like silk, linen, cotton, leather. And I had a bunch of silk shirts, um, a dress, and that had visible mold on it. Very small amounts, but visible mold. And I managed to actually save some of them, but some of the others, the mold growth kept coming back and they ended up going in the bin. And so it's a bit of a process. And I I do really understand how difficult it is for people. It's very stressful. Even if you have the means to replace anything like, you know, belongings are something that we can be so attached to. Um, For me personally, I lost tens of thousands of dollars worth of textbooks, medical textbooks, every textbook I'd had since I was a student, you know, through till now. Um, And also some of my certificates got destroyed um, along with photos of, you know, my childhood that, you know, I don't have. And there are some specialist remediation techniques you can apply to certain things like that, if you want to preserve them, but essentially they end up being sealed and encased in, you know, um, airtight glass so that the contaminants don't come through to make you sick and it's expensive. So you have to really be quite choosy. Um, And, you know, the couch, even though I would never recommend keeping a couch, especially if it's fabric rather than leather, a couch is going to be less problematic than a moldy mattress or a pillow because you sleep Mm. on that for eight hours. So, you know, if you were desperate and wanted to have something to sit on and we're going to keep the couch but replace the mattress and the pillow, well, that would be better than doing it the other way around. Um, But, you know, I would also be setting up containment and using air purifiers if I was going to do something like that. And to be honest, having been deathly ill from mould, I just, I would happily sleep on a camping stretcher and sit in a camping chair use an air mattress and have nothing than allow something to make me feel ill. But what I can see happening here is because people have no other way of replacing their possessions. And in many cases, they are going to hold on to stuff that they shouldn't from a health perspective. And they are going to move back into buildings that from a health perspective are unhealthy. And we're going to see a very, I believe, a long and drawn out situation where people are unwell and it's going to take some time before people are going to reach a point with us so ill that they're willing just to get rid of everything that they own and start again Mm, yeah yeah it's gosh it's it's a big it's a big thing to reconcile and I think that I mean I think once you've gone through the experience of having mold illness and mm-hmm. being really affected by it and learning about it. Like the more you learn, like you cannot unlearn this stuff. And mm-hmm. I think that it's a blessing to know, but it doesn't make it easy to let go of certain things. So 
yeah, I mean, essentially it's up to each person, but I think try not to ignore Mm. these little things because as much as we want it not to matter, Mm. you know, it does. Mm. And the road back from old illness can be a very long emotionally, physically, financially, mentally, you know, road if if you let things snowball. Yeah. So the next thing I wanted to speak to, well, first of all, if is there anything else you want to add to the remediation, you know, what can you salvage, what can you not, and how to go about that before we perhaps talk ar- about prevention being better than cure mm-hmm. and what maybe, you know, you'd like to share in, in that space? Is there anything else you'd like to add before we move on to that? Look, I think that's probably enough. I mean, in an ideal world, you'd have a professional come in and assess the home and assess your belongings. Um, but there is no perfect tool or perfect science to do that. And, you know, I found out the hard way when it came to our mattress, um, just to give you a real life example, um, we had a queen size mattress on a at the time, I think the bed frame was actually like a bit of a um, a cheaper one that was like an MDF laminate covered thing from like Super Amart. It was like white. Um, and to be honest, the laminate, like none of the actual frame was swollen in any way. And our bedroom, although it was adjacent to the bathroom that was leaking, there was no visible mold on the actual frame. I think there may have been a little bit of visible mold on the slats underneath, uh, but the mattress, we actually did a surface sample test and it came up clear. However, uh, when I went to strip the mattress protector cover off it to wash it as we were sort of resetting up the home, when I peeled it back, the whole mattress was just green with mold inside. Mm. And so, again, it's a real balancing act. I do recommend getting professional advice, but, um, you know, having just sort of gone through the categories that we've got, for the most part, I think it's going to be less costly to replace things than have it tested and also risk having the test not really demonstrate how problematic a condition the item actually is in. Um, so I would probably reserve my resources if it was me to have the actual building assessed and get some professional guidance on how to remediate what I knew was, you know, not porous or only semi-porous and just replace the rest because eventually, you know, those things aren't going to be that in healthy condition anyway. Um, so yeah, it's tricky, but if you want guidance, there are a lot of building biologists that offer online consults as well. And, you know, of course you can always test as much as you want, but because that adds up, I think oftentimes you're better off just funneling your financial, um, resources into replacing rather than mucking around with testing, um, and possibly not actually getting an accurate assessment either. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. I like that. Mm. And okay. So prevention, how, Mm. like, what do you want to share here given, I mean, and we can also refer back to previous episodes because you've Mm. done a lot of speaking about this, even in the short time we've been running the podcast this year, Mm. but is there anything you want to highlight as far as preventative measures go in the context of what's been happening with the floods? Yeah. So I guess this is probably just a an unfortunate reminder to everyone that preventing mold in your home is far easier than trying to rescue a property that has been water damaged. And obviously in the case of flooding, there's nothing anyone could do to prevent that. Um, but in the event you have water intrusion, whether it's from a burst pipe, a major leak or a flood, The ideal scenario is that you would get your building materials and items bone dry in 48 hours. Now, that was just simply not possible for the people that were affected in this case. The floodwaters were so persistent 
um, and then with no power. You couldn't run a dehumidifier or mm. any other sort of um, devices that would have dried the home. But let's say you were in a position where you could do that. You would want to, um, if it was still damp outside or humid, you would want to close up the house and use extractors and fans and heaters and dehumidifiers to try and vacuum the moisture out of those materials as quickly as possible. And, you know, if you've got carpets, you would lift those and the underlay to dry separately or at least allow air to circulate between the layers. You definitely don't want to leave that sitting on the floor. Um, Anything can just speed up drainage under the house as well would obviously be really helpful. One of the issues that we're having here is um, in particular those little pockets where air movement isn't so prolific. Like, for example, I've got a friend in South Golden Beach whose home was not particularly affected. It was just the garage and the laundry, but because everyone's had to dump their waterlogged belongings outside the external air quality is really toxic because of all the mold proliferating because of the mm. debris that's sitting there that hasn't been collected yet um and we don't even know when that's going to be taken care of so yeah close up the windows and allow the devices to do the job if that's feasible if it's hot and sunny and dry then you can use fans and heaters and leave the windows open and allow the moisture just to move naturally via osmosis into the outdoor air um, but just referring back to um, the three tools that you should ideally have in a household to prevent mold, um, one of them was a dehumidifier. So, you know, Harvey Norman's completely sold out of dehumidifiers here because everyone rushed out to buy one afterwards. Mm. I really just think as part of home maintenance, every home should have at least one because, you know, thrills and spills are inevitable as a human being and, you know, um, the building envelope will deteriorate over time and a roof leak is probably going to be something we'll experience at some time. So a dehumidifier would be key. Um, and then, of course, a moisture meter, which you can get very cheaply from Bunnings if, if that's your only option, is going to allow you to actually monitor things like the plasterboard. Is it drying up quickly enough? And if it isn't, you can actually demarcate on the wall or wherever it is you've got this building material, like what has remained damp after 48 hours and actually, you know, mark where it needs to be cut out from as opposed to just maybe tearing the whole thing down wholesale, potentially unnecessarily. Mm. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think those those things would be really important to have in the home. Obviously, the thermohygrometer, which we've spoken about too, will help you work out whether the humidity is lower outside than it is inside or vice versa, because that's going to determine whether you shut the windows or not. Like, like I said, today's the first day we've had sunshine and it's just been raining just constantly, which means the outdoor humidity is very high. So even if you leave the windows open, you're only allowing more moisture into the wet home. You're not actually going to achieve anything and allow moisture to get out. So that would be something else that I would just say you can determine that because I, you know, I even spoke to a friend last night who, again, wasn't flooded but is, you know, in this area where it's high humidity and they were under the impression that leaving the windows open for airflow was still better than mm. closing up the house and running the dehumidifier when it's not because you're just allowing moisture in into all of your things. So yeah. it is an area where you know, the education just isn't there yet. Um, and even whilst I think the government authorities' advice has improved over the last couple of years, it's still not where it could and should be. And um, unfortunately, there are still practices being promoted like fogging or spraying chemicals to hashtag kill mold when it's really not addressing the issue and not it's not the healthiest way to do it either. No. And one thing I wanted to ask you that just made me think of it is what about if someone doesn't have a dehumidifier yet and they're in a situation where the humidity is really high outside mm. and they have an air conditioner mm. would you recommend that they use their air conditioner like is there any benefit to running that um, mm. in terms of keeping things I guess drier 
Mm, yeah. So air conditioning actually has a naturally sort of naturally inbuilt dehumidifying effect. It's not as effective, I don't believe, as a proper dehumidifier. Um, but if you have the option to run it on dry mode, it gets kind of close. It gets kind of close and you would be better off closing up the house and running the dehumidifier, um, sorry, the air conditioner, especially if it's got dry mode. Now, depending on what, what season you're in will depend on where you set the temperature. So the warmer the air, the more moisture it can hold. So what I mean by that is if it's winter, where you are, or it's cold, I should say, because not everyone's winters are cold. If it's cold and it's damp, simply heating the space that you're in the home will lift some of the moisture off the surfaces and into the air, which is a good thing. And then if you have a sort of a split system that can heat and dry at the same time, brilliant. Well, that will work really nicely too. Currently, you know, as of the time of this recording, it's actually still very hot here, even though it's technically autumn or fall, depending on where you listen to this from. Um, and it's still very warm. So there isn't like currently just looking at the thermohygrometer in my office, it's almost 27 degrees Celsius. So it's hot. I mean, you singlet in short weather, swimsuit weather. Yeah. Um, so you don't want to be like warming the air any further. It's going to be um, problematic from a health perspective as a human being, but just simply running the dry mode is going to be really helpful for people there too. Mm, that's good to know because I think, yeah, it's good to know just like what can you do if you've already like with what you've got while you wait. Cause I, I even have seen online that a lot of these dehumidifiers and air purifiers are out of stock at the moment, understandably. Mm. Um, and of course they will come back in stock, but it's just good to know, okay, if you're in a situation where all you have is an air conditioner, is mm. that of use? So that's that's good to know. Mm. Um, okay. Is there anything else that you want to add or that you want to round out the conversation with before we wrap up? Mm. So I guess the, the final things I want to say is unfortunately, um, we don't yet have here in Australia at least a legal standard from a health perspective when it comes to water damage. And so what I mean by that is if you are renting the property that you're in and there is significant water intrusion and water damage, it's quite difficult to hold the landlord to account in order to get the repairs done to a standard that would be helpful for you and anybody else who lives in that building. And so I guess what I want to say from someone who's had a fair few rodeos <laughs> supporting uh, people who rent, who's also been a renter inside a property that was significantly water damaged, it is more often than not less stress to simply take them to the tribunal to break the lease and get compensation and moving costs and find somewhere else. Now, the rental market is a bit crazy throughout Australia at the moment. So that's may not necessarily be the case for you. Um, and certainly here with ta whole towns being wiped out. I mean, I just, there just isn't anywhere else for people to go. I know it's not that easy, but um, I would just say that please know it's more often than not, not worth trying to fight to get the place fixed appropriately. And you're better off looking at maybe thinking outside the box, whether it's camper vans, camping temporarily, whatever the case may be. I know everyone's circumstances are different. That's not going to necessarily work for people with children or pets and, you know, extended families and things like that. But it's sadly quite difficult. That being said, the Residential Tenancies Act has been improved in recent years where the home has to be uh, considered habitable for human use and therefore a building biologist's report should it reveal toxigenic mould and therefore mycotoxin producing fungi can be used in order to get compensation if perhaps the leak wasn't addressed properly by the, the landlord or at least breaking the lease. Um, 
So if you're looking for a building biologist, I the best place to find one is the Australian Society of Building Biologists and their website, which we'll have in the show notes as well, is asbb.org.au. Now, building biologists that have trained more recently have actually uh, trained as mould testing technicians as well. And but if there are previously trained like more than four years ago, they will likely have done that as an elective anyway. So just double check they've got the training. There is also the option to do that training as a standalone, um, which means, uh, you know, you can just get a mould testing technician in. The final thing I would say is certainly they can do a report. If you own the property, it's going to help you work out the kind of remediation you need to do. Um, But it's also going to help give you the evidence that you might need in the event you're trying to break a lease and move somewhere new. And then the last thing I want to say is if you do own the property and you're looking to get remediation done, make sure you're using a double ICRC certified remediator, which, and ensure it's not just the company that you reach out to, but the actual person who comes to do the work holds that certification and intends to adhere to the standards and guides set by the double ICRC from a health point of view, that would be really important too. So I hope that helps uh, you to understand really the magnitude of remediation, what it takes to prevent mold issues in a home and what it takes to repair them. And certainly if you have any questions or you're looking for some one-on-one support, um, you can certainly reach out to me as well. Um, The ICRC website is simply iicrc.org. And they have a um, a button for the global locator. Literally anywhere in the world, you can find someone to come and do that work. So the other two professionals that you need, the building biologist slash mold testing technician and a double ICIC certified remediator. And between the two of them, they can help you get your home sorted out if that's something you have control over. But yeah, like I said, if you are a tenant, it really depends on how willing and able a landlord is to do the proper work. That being said, in the event of a flood, if they have insurance for water damage, that should be covered. So in the first instance, can I recommend just a friendly conversation and educating them because most people are completely unaware of, um, I guess, the health implications of this. And that's why it's so important to use people who are trained to assess and address these issues, who are conscious of the health effects and not just coming at it from like a structural point of view or a cosmetic point of view. Mm. Wow. Wow. So much good information. I think Well, yeah, I mean, on behalf of everyone listening, I just want to say thank you for letting us pick your brain. And I know this is something so close to your heart that in so many ways, the mold, the floods being close, friends and family and colleagues Mm. and patients being affected. And I think, you know, we are very open to doing more, um, you know, questions and answers on this. You can reach out to us and we can put something Mm. together, but hopefully this episode, as well as the other few that we've done on mold and healthy homes so far, it's an abundance of information. And honestly, I think this, we just keep finding new ways to reiterate the importance also, I think, of people definitely keeping on their radar when your mold proof your home course Mm. comes up. Because I mean, gosh, I mean, please take your time to recover yourself, but also- (laughs) you know, wow, what a, what a timely course in terms Mm. of getting that information out there as well. So we'll make sure that all those links are in the show notes, but is there anything you want to um, wrap up with? Look, I think um, obviously for everyone who's been affected by the flood, there's a lot on your plate right now. So if you're looking for specific help, please just reach out to me. I do offer online consultations and can give you a lot of guidance without ever having to step foot in your home. Um, 
And if you are impacted, I can absolutely connect you with someone who can come and visit your home in the event that you think that you need that. Um, That being said, so much of it is obviously going to be a problem. You can kind of, you can kind of jump ahead most of the time. Um, But yeah, I think it is really just a timely experience to highlight why preventing mold and addressing water or moisture issues in the home as soon as humanly possible is just so important. So yeah, it's unfortunate that there's a delay with mold proof your home just because the last couple of weeks have been horrific. Um, But in the next couple of weeks, that will be ready to go. And if you are someone who has not been impacted by flood or water intrusion so far, but you're a bit curious about whether or not your home has mold. And I actually do have a free webinar coming up in about 10 days called the seven sneaky signs that your home has a mold problem. And obviously if you can see mold, there's a mold problem. (laughs) So yeah, that's like the most obvious thing. Or if you can smell it, sure. Um, But there are some other more subtle signs that might actually highlight there's a mold problem when it's not so obvious. So if you're keen just to come and have a little poke around and, and really get get a handle on those more nuanced um, signs and symptoms in a home. I would love you to join me. If you do join live, you'll have the option to ask me questions and actually get them answered at the end of the webinar too. Um, But if you need me before that, please feel free to reach out. Now that I've got internet back, I'll be able to see you on the gram. Amazing. Well, thank you. And thanks everyone to listening. We look forward to being in your ear holes again next week. Mm-hmm.